Praise God. Get your notebook out. Get ready. We're going into the last days. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Good to be with you tonight. Uh, let me get myself on here, if I can. Here we go. Okay, praise God. Amen. We're live. Praise the Lord. God bless you guys. Good to have you here tonight. Amen. I tell you, it is exciting. I can't believe what the Lord is doing. You know, uh, I was just at a, a wedding. My nephew, my niece's son, actually, my great nephew, got married uh, a year ago. They only had the reception this weekend. And we were there, Javon and I were there, and we had a great time there. And I had a fantastic conversation with my brother-in-law, Pastor Rick Saladon, who does a great show on YouTube called Straight Talk with Pastor Rick. You guys ought to look that up on YouTube if you have YouTube. Check it out, Straight Talk with Pastor Rick. He's got a great uh, message every week. He puts up two or three five-minute messages, really good stuff. So join him. But we had a tremendous time talking about the last days. I'll tell you, it's amazing. You know, we're just... Uh, thinking about how independently we've come to so many of the same conclusions about what's actually going on right now in these last days. Amen. Let's pray tonight, okay guys? All right, we're going to lift up our hearts to the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you. We ask you for the power of the Holy Spirit to be with us. We ask you for the spirit of revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We ask you for the spirit of revelation for these last days. Holy Spirit, we ask you to illuminate our minds, illuminate our hearts, bring us into your will. Show us how we can survive the last days because, Lord, that's exactly what's going on. Food shortages are coming. Fuel shortages are coming. Things are going to start to change. There's so much going on in this world that we need your help, Father. So in Jesus' name, we pray for wisdom, for strategy, for understanding. And most of all, Lord, we pray for faith. Faith to overcome. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the Word of God tonight real quick. And let's go to a place. It's one of my favorite places in the Bible. And I think you like it too. It's Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to start at verse 10. Finally, my brethren. Now, Paul's given a finally because he's saying, hey, I've been talking about a lot of stuff, but finally, I want you to know this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. You know, that's the same type of thing that the Lord, the angel of the Lord, uh, spoke to Joshua when he said to him, be strong and be courageous. He wasn't saying, well, I'd like you to be strong and be courageous. He's saying, be strong and be courageous. And Paul says, be strong in the Lord. How do you get strong in the Lord? Well, you've got to know the Lord, number one, and you've got to have a walk with God, number two. You've got to be in touch with the Holy Spirit because he is, he is God with us right now. Jesus was God with us in the flesh. The Holy Spirit is God with us inside right now. Amen. So be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Never think more of yourself than you ought to think. Never think that you have arrived you're ready to battle demons. You're ready to do this and do that. Always think of yourself in a humble manner and say, Lord, I depend on you. And then he says this, here's what we're going to need to fight the good fight in the last days. Put on the whole armor of God. Put the whole armor of God on. You've got to know what the armor is and what it does. You've got to be prepared because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and the rulers of the darkness of this world, against wicked spirits in heavenly places, and God's on our side. So we're going to win, amen, as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus. Praise God. All right, folks, we're going back into the Old Testament again. We're going to go into Genesis chapter 10, starting at verse 8. We're going to read some familiar verses for some of you. Some of you have been with me for a little while now. This is about the 12th or 13th week we're doing this, maybe the 14th, and it's just been going so great. I'm really excited about how things are going here. And again, if you are watching on Facebook right now, hit the share button. Share it with somebody else. Tell them to get on. Get your friends on. Let's get the word out how we can become overcomers and we can get to understand what God is doing in these last days. And also, if you want to join the, the live chat, if you want to get your questions answered or make your comments, you got to go to www.frankdupre.online. And right there on the homepage, 
you'll find us live and you'll be able to then pop into that and get into the live chat with us, okay? Praise God. we got a bunch of people on tonight. We've got uh, uh, Apostle Rachel Gordon on from Long Island, New York. God bless you. Uh, Nikki is on tonight. Uh, Andy, Kathy, Alberta, Diane, Jack. God bless you guys. And again, share this with others. Let them know. Send a text to somebody. You probably have a text. Let's say, hey, get online. Watch Bishop Frank talking about the last days and you'll enjoy it. Amen. Be a blessing. And it'll help this grow. You know, we got it. People have to wake up. We, we talk about a woke society. But we, need a, we need a church that's awake. Not, not a woke church, an awake church. Amen. So Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one. In the Hebrew, it's Gaborim. He became, he began to become a mighty one. And that, that phrase, mighty one, what we have to understand is the Bible wasn't written for us. Oh, wait a second, Bishop, what are you saying? What's written for us? What I mean technically is it was written for the people of the day. It was written for the people living in that day. So they use words and phrases that those people understood. Now, it was written for us. So we need to take those words and phrases that they understood and put them into our language today and understand them that way. Okay, so it was written for us. I haven't blasphemed. It was written for us, but technically it was written for them. Okay, so we glean from this. We get from this. So in, in, in Genesis 10 verse 8, when it says, And Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one, a Gaborim, in the earth. That word there means he began to be a giant because in the ancient times and especially back in the days of Moses, when they referred to the mighty ones, they were talking about the demigods, the half angel, half human demigods. And that's who they were talking about. Hercules, Achilles, others, they were mighty ones in the earth. So that's who Moses is referring to. He's not just saying he's a good fighter. No, he was a he began to become a mighty one. Something was happening in his DNA. I think he was getting a fallen angel upgrade. He was getting somehow they were hooking him up somehow. And if you don't think that if you know fallen angel technology includes DNA stuff, uh, it was God who said to his divine counsel, those members of his divine counsel in, the, in Genesis chapter, chapter 1, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And they understand DNA. They understand genome. They understand all these different things. And the technology they've got goes way, way, way beyond anything we've got. They've been around for millennia, not, not for a thousand years, multi, multi-millennia. They've been around for eons and eons. And so they have a lot of knowledge that we don't have. Pastor Joni, God bless you. Good to have you here tonight. Pete, good to have you back on again. Always good to see you on a, a Monday night. And also Reverend Lynette, God bless you. Again, folks, share it with somebody. If you're on Facebook or even if you're online on my site, go to Facebook, log in, and then share it right there and tell them, get online with us and get into the conversation. Okay? And let's see. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That phrase, before the Lord, means this. He stuck his fist in God's face. I'm a mighty hunter. I don't need you. He was a mighty hunter. And the ancient ones, the ancient Jewish texts, they tell us that that phrase meant he was a hunter of men. A hunter of men. The Geborim, the giants, were cannibals. So we're just inferring these things from here, okay? So, you know, you, you may say, you know, I have a hard time believing this. That's okay. Hey, I have a hard time believing some of this stuff too. And, and a lot of it, I wouldn't say I believe it. I would say, I think it's true. I can't be positive or sure. The word of God doesn't say this, this, and that. When it says this, this, and that, I believe this, this, and that. But when it just tells us different things, then I think these things are true. And that's where I'm coming from right now. So it says here, verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel or Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. And he had one, two, three, four kingdoms in the land of Shinar. Now that word Akkad, that is, that, that speaks of actually not only a place, but an ancient language, Akkadian. Akkadian is an ancient language, and a lot of what we know 
about the Bible history and the ancient times comes from things that have been found in the Akkadian language. So these things are tied together. So it, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. The first one, number one, Babel. He built the city of Babel. And then he built Erech. And then he built Akkad. And then he built Kalne in the land of Shinar. And this is in chapter 10. So we're talking about the descendants of Ham. Cursed be Canaan because of Ham. The sin of Canaan was so heinous that, Mo, that, that Noah said, your, grandson, your son is cursed. My, my, my grandson is cursed because of you. Because you're such an evil person and you're bringing this into your own family. And, and we know that, that the line of Ham is the line that brought about all these horrible things as time went by. So he began to become a Gaborim. Something took place. So a change was happening. And because a change was happening, that means he was in touch with fallen angels. He was in touch with them. Something was happening. There's communication going on at that time. Now, why would he be in touch with fallen angels? I mean, the Lord just destroyed the whole world only a few years earlier, maybe a hundred years earlier or so. Before that, the whole thing was flooded. But you know what? Everything that Ham knew about the ancient times, the antediluvian times, the days before the flood, and how the giants were there, and how the fallen angels were there, and how they worshipped them, and how they had power, and how they had money, and how they were rich, and they were great, and they built great cities, and they did all these things. He had all that knowledge. He had, In fact, he lived in those days, so he knew what was going on. He passed this on to his son Canaan, and Canaan passed it on to others, and Cush passed it on to Nimrod. And by the time Nimrod got it, he said, I want to be a mighty one. I want to be like a Nephilim. I want to be, uh, I want to be part angelic fallen angel. I, I want the power of that. And so he began to build the city. He began to build where he was and began to create everything he could do. And what happened there? He began to build the ziggurats. He began to build the Tower of Babel. And so the Word of God tells us, that in Genesis 11, starting in verse 1, now the whole earth had one language and one speech. One language, one understanding. It came to pass as they journeyed from the east, as they left where they were with Noah, and they left the mountains of Ararat, went towards the east into the plains of Shinar, into that place between the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers the Fertile Crescent. As they went there, they found the plains in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick instead of stone, and, for more, and, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Let's build ourselves a city and a tower, a ziggurat, whose top is in the heavens, not in the, not in the sky. You know, we call a mighty tower today a skyscraper because it goes so high up in the sky. We don't say it reaches heaven, but it reaches into the sky. They were, but they weren't just saying, we want to reach into the sky. What were they saying? They were saying, we want to get into the second heavens. We want to get into the realm of the watchers, the fallen angels. We want to get into that realm. We want communication back and forth. We want to create... Folks, this might sound crazy. We want to create a stargate. We want to create a portal. We want a place where they can come in and co go, and then maybe we can go there, and, and all, all these things were going on. Because remember, Nimrod knows back in the days of Noah, before the flood, there were the psychedelics. There were the experiences of entering the second heavens. There was uh, the, the, the sexual relations with the fallen angels, with the, with the Nephilim, with the, all this stuff going on. He wants this back. So he's building a tower, a ziggurat, that goes into the heavens. And what happens there? We know that the Lord said in Genesis 11 verse 5, the Lord came down to look at the city. And what happened? He looked at the city. And what did he say? He said, this isn't good. This is not good. We got to get rid of this stuff. Nimrod is, is doing, he's going crazy. And he says, look, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, in other words, after they do this, after they build this tower into the second heavens, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. God was saying, if they connect with the fallen ones in the second heavens, it's going to be hell on earth again. Nothing is going to be impossible. So the Lord does something. He says, Come. He, who's he talking to? He's talking to his divine counsel. He's talking to his faithful angels. 
And he says, come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. And in that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world and they stopped building the city. And that is why the city is called Babel. This is where the word Babylon comes from, confusion, because that's where the Lord confused the people with the different languages. And that's the way he scattered them all over the world. Now, if you remember, I mentioned to you that that word Babel, that actually means gate of God. They were building a tower as a gate, a stargate to the gods. That's what they were doing. And so uh, that's how the Lord stopped the building. He confused their languages. The Lord went down to see the building and the tower. He said, they're one. We're going to confuse their speech and destroyed that ability. And instead of them all speaking one language and being united, now they spoke many languages and they were confused. They had confusion. And different families spoke different tongues, different languages. So if, you, if, you're, if your patriarch was this one, you spoke a language and all that family all spoke that language. And then another one spoke a different language. And so what happened is God separated all the people from being one, all the descendants of Ham, all the descendants of Shem and Japheth also, everybody began to speak a different language. And so they scattered throughout the earth. He confused their languages. He confused their tongues. And his plan was not to destroy the people with a flood again or with something else. No, he didn't want to destroy them. This is what he said. He said, so you want fallen angels? You want this stuff? I'm going to give it to you. You can have it. Let's see how you like it. And he stepped away. And the Bible tells us that the Lord disinherited the nations. He disinherited the nations because all these people groups were 70 nations. If you look in Genesis 10, it gives us what they call the table of the nations, the names of all the nations. 70 nations are named and he disinherited them. But the Lord chose for himself to make a new nation with Abraham. And he did that years and years later. Okay? So he said, I'm disinheriting you. But I'm going to reserve to myself the right to make a new nation. And I'm going to raise up a man. And where did he bring Abraham out of? He brought him out of Ur of the Chaldees. The Chaldeans. You know what the Chaldeans means? The Babylonians. He took him right out of the middle of the Babylonian confusion as time went by. And he separated him to himself. And he raised up a mighty nation out of Abraham. And he reserved that nation to himself. So let's take a look at something. We're talking about the days of Noah. Okay? Go with me in your Bible. Go with me to Romans chapter 1. And we're going to start reading at verse 21, okay? Romans 1. I'm going to write it down here. Romans 1, 21 is where we're going to start. All right? Now, uh, Andy's asking the question, uh, is there going to be a Nimrod for our of our day? Um, actually, I think there are already a number of Nimrods for our day. I think there's a number of people who are really hooked up already with fallen angels. I think there's a lot of stuff going on here. As the weeks go by, I'll talk about more and more things, get into more and more things. I, I'm trying to do this a little slow because if I tell you everything that I think is going on and that might be going on, you might just say, you're nuts and hang up on me and just stop watching. But I think if I build, 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 build a little at a time, you'll be ready for some of the things that I'll give to you in Revelation the book of Revelation in, in the Bible. So Romans chapter 1. Let's look at how the world was back in the days of Noah once again. Because of that, when they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. He's talking about the people basically in the ancient times. In the days of Noah and the days afterwards, the days of Nimrod and others. And he says they were not thankful, but they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men and into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their heart. 
So he's saying in that time, the people who knew him and they should have worshipped him decided not to. And then they took other things and said, these are our gods. And then God gave them up. What I just said, he disinherited them. He said, you want fallen angels? You want these things? You want this stuff in your life? You can have it. I disinherit you. You're not mine anymore. I give you up. And so he says he gave them up and they dishonored their own bodies between themselves. They changed the truth of God into a lie and they worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Some of you, if you watch different things on TV, uh, you'll see different things. Right now, there's a tremendous trend in teenage girls to become trans. They just used the word trans. They're becoming trans. Meaning what? They're going transgenderism. They're leaving being a woman, being a girl, and they're trying to be a boy, a man. And this is happening today. It's a trend going on today. It's really trending. If you search it out, you'll find out. And this is exactly what happened back then. The women were leaving their own use of who they are as a woman, and they were transgendering and doing things like that. And then they were also, this is also talking about the lesbianism, the homosexuality, things like that. They did not retain God in their knowledge. And also, verse 27, excuse me, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of woman, they burned in lust towards one another, men with men doing what is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the, re the recompense of their error, which was their just rewards. So sicknesses, diseases, things happen like this happened, and that was their just rewards, God is saying here. He says, they did not retain God in their knowledge, so God gave them over to a reprobate mind. So he did two things. He gave them up and he gave them over. And it, both of them have to deal with their mind and their heart. He gave them up to their own hearts, their own lustful thoughts in their hearts, and he gave them over to a reprobate mind, a crooked mind, a mind that doesn't think right. And they did things which are not right. Being filled with all, now listen to this list, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, anger and strife, debate, malignity, whispering, backbiting, haters of God, despiteful people, proud people, haters of their parents, boasters, inventors of evil things, murderers, full of envy, uh, disobedient to parents, without understanding, truce breakers and covenant breakers who have no natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they commit such things are worthy of death, not only do that, but they rejoice when others do it too. That's, that's, that's satanic. That's Luciferian. Rejoicing in evil instead of rejoicing in good. That's who they were. Now, that's who they were in the antediluvian and the post-Diluvian days, right around the flood. Look what Paul says to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, okay, verses 3, uh, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 3, I don't know why I'm not saying that right, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, okay, this is what he says, I want you to know this, Timothy, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Perilous. What's the word perilous mean? Perilous means in danger of death. On the edge, on the precipice of death. Remember the old uh, things on TV and uh, old, old, old time movies from the early 1900s? The perils of Pauline. The girls tied up on the tracks and you hear the music. And then the train is coming and the wicked man is laughing and everything. Perils, perilous times. This is what Paul is saying. Perilous times are here. And folks, the train is coming down the track and people are tied to the track. And Satan, the evil one, he is laughing about what's about to take place. And this is what he says. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, covenant breakers, false accusers, liars, incontinent, can't contain their emotions, fierce, fierce, 
That's a bad one. Despisers of those who are good. Underline that one if you got your Bible out. They despise you. They hate you. They're traitors. They're heady. They're full of themselves. They're high-minded. They think too highly of themselves. They're lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of God. And you need to turn away from them. So Paul is describing the same attitudes and the same actions of those who lived in those earlier times, those earlier days, as those who live now. Luke 17, 26, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Paul tells us how it was in the days of Noah before and after the flood. And then Paul tells us what it's going to be like in the last days. He says to Timothy, Timothy, you got to understand this. Timothy, you got to preach to people. You got to tell the truth. You got to tell people, stay away from certain kind of people because they only get worse and worse and worse. So I mentioned and I said, God gave them up and he gave them over. So how did he give them up? And how did he give them over? He gave them over to a reprobate mind. That's what he did there. Gave them up and over to a reprobate mind. That's what it said in the word of God. So let's take a look at this now for a second. What did he do to give them up? Gave them up to a reprobate mind. Hmm. What's a reprobate mind? It's a mind that can't think the truth. It's a mind that can't understand God. It's a mind that doesn't want to understand God. It's a mind that hates the things of God. It's a mind that is proud, covetous, liar, a cheater, a breaker of covenants and deals and agreements. It's, it's someone who loves themselves. It's a person who loves the pleasure. It's a person who will switch their gender, their identity. They'll do anything they want to do because they just want to feel good. That's a reprobate mind. That's what it was like in the days of Noah. They were reprobates. And that's what Paul says they're going to be like in the end times, in the last days. They're going to be reprobates. And I think one of the most important things that Paul says to us is he says to us, they despise those who do good. They despise you. They despise you. They despise you. You got to be careful, folks. You got to be careful who you stay with, who you hang out with, who your friends are. You got to watch who your children go to school with. You got to watch who they stay with. There's so many of us who have had problems with our kids because we were watching them. We didn't watch them closely enough. We should have investigated more. We should have invaded their privacy. We should have done things, but we didn't. And now we pay the price because they're in trouble. They got problems. Things are going on in their lives. So here's what happened. He gave them over to the control of the fallen watchers, the evil sons of God. Okay? The evil sons of God. Let me get the scripture verse for you on this. Okay? Just let me get over here in, the, in Genesis again. Okay? No, it's in Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy. Uh, one second. Let me get this scripture. Uh -huh. The nations. Nations and one thing here. One second. Nations. I'm trying to get this for you, folks. Ah, uh, and sons. Doing a search in my Bible here so I can do the get something going here. The nations and the sons. Nations and sons. All right. Anyway, in Deuteronomy, I'm not going to take the time to look it up right now. In Deuteronomy, the Word of God tells us that the Lord gave them over to the fallen angels, to the sons of God. And he divided the nations and gave, there it is, Deuteronomy 38, verse 2. Uh, excuse me, I got, I'm, I'm switching numbers tonight. Excuse me, folks. Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, okay? I'm going to give it to you here, and I'm going to give you the translation I'm reading, because if you use a different translation, you just might not see what I'm talking about, okay? So Deuteronomy 32 verse 8 in the New Living Translation, and here's what it says. It says, When the Most High assigned lands to the nations, when he divided up the human race, when did he divide the human race? At the Tower of Babel. When he gave them up, and he gave them over, how did he do it? He established the boundaries of the people according to the number in his heavenly court, the sons of God. 
in the Septuagint Bible, which is the translation from Hebrew to Greek, which was the Bible Jesus actually literally had in his day. It was the most used Bible of the times of Jesus because most of the people spoke Greek by the time Jesus was born. The Greeks had ruled the land for hundreds of years and everybody was speaking Greek. The business was done in Greek. Then the Romans took over, but even the Romans spoke Greek. And so the Septuagint Bible is a as literal a translation as you can get from Hebrew into Greek. And in that Bible, it says that it was according to the number in his heavenly court, according to the number of the sons of God. So who are these sons of God? What is this heavenly court? Let's take a look at this here, okay? I'll give you a couple of scriptures for this too. And let's see where we, where we are here. All right. We call it the divine council. Divine because it's made up of immortals. Remember last week I talked about the immortals, the divine ones. What does it mean to be divine? It means to have the attribute of God of immortality. God is immortal. And so being a part of his divine council or his heavenly congregation or the sons of God, he has, among all the angels, he had a council that he worked with. And as I mentioned, he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. He's talking to his divine council. He's talking to those who are with him who can do these things. When, uh, so I'm, I can't get ahead of myself. I've got to be careful. Okay, so we're talking about the watchers, the fallen angels. They're called the watchers in the Bible, okay? And we have to see that that's what's going on there. They were called the watchers. They're supposed to watch over man, but they sinned. And they came to earth and they took over and they destroyed the earth and they filled the earth with violence and corruption and God sent the flood because of it. So that's who these fallen ones were. So God says, you don't want me, you want them, I'm going to give you up to them. I'm up, giving you up to them. They're in the heavenly realm. They're in the second heavens. I'm going to give you up to them. I'm going to give you over to them. They're going to take over. Okay, literally, that's exactly what the Lord is saying. I'm going to give you up and give you over. He gave them under the control of the fallen, evil sons of God, the watchers, those who were a part of Satan's rebellion. Now, this is where it gets a little interesting here. So uh, some of you may not have heard me talk about this before, the divine council or these fallen angels, the watchers. Uh, if you haven't, uh, stick with me and just follow along and let the Lord work in your heart right now. Uh, and, and see what's happening, okay? God's going to do some great things here tonight, going to give you wisdom and understanding, all right? And again, now, uh, I, I know I got Maria Martorella, I got Apostle Ruth Parker, you guys are on, on Facebook, so jump over to frankdupre.online and join in the conversation there, okay? Get in on the live chat. Thank you for, for being there, and don't forget to share with others where you are tonight, what are you listening to? Now, uh, how many of you know that there's only one God? No brainer, right? Only one God. There's, there's no other gods. There's no such thing as other gods. You know, they're just idols. They're made of wood, steel, uh, silver, gold, whatever. You know, they carve them. They make them. They have eyes, but they see not. They have hands, but they feel not. That's what the Bible says about the idols. But listen, the idols that the Bible's talking about there, they're not gods. They're, they're the work of man's hands. But the things they represent, they are gods with small g okay gods with a small g or maybe i did that backwards gods with a small g gods with a small thing they are the sons of god and they are the gods that's what they called them back in the ancient times when these fallen angels came to earth they said the gods have come down to us the gods are among us and their children were called demigods half gods half human half gods so most people think that when the Bible talks about gods, they're just talking about statues, things like that. But it's not. You see, they represent real beings, divine beings. And again, divine meaning immortal. They don't die. Okay? Let's look at the Word of God. Go with me into the Word of God. I'll give you a couple of uh, scriptures here. I'll copy them and I'll paste them into the chat here so you guys can look them up and you can uh, follow on these. The first one is Psalm 82. Okay? Psalm 82, verse 1, and we're going to read it in two different translations, okay? We're going to read it actually in three translations. We'll read it in the uh, English Standard Version, the New Living Translation, and the King James, all right? God has taken his place 
in the divine council. See, it's in the Bible. In the midst of the who? In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Okay? So the Bible talks about small g gods that God has as a divine council, and in the middle of them, he holds his court. In the New Living Translation, God presides over heaven's court. He pronounces judgment on the heavenly beings. So they're translating it into heavenly beings because they're trying to tell you that these gods are heavenly beings. We would call them angels. And But remember, angel is it's a, it's a job description. It doesn't say who they are. It says what they do. Angel means messenger. So when God sends a, a, a heavenly being or a divine being to us, he's sending them as a messenger, and so they are an angel. Okay? In the King James Version, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. You know, uh, that's a good translation in one way because I was telling you about the mighty ones. That word mighty is used to designate those who have heavenly qualities. So God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. He judges among the gods. So, again, in the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. He judges the heavenly beings. He judges among the gods. So the Bible is telling us that God has a divine council, a heavenly court. Some of you are familiar with the teaching on, on, on prayer and intercession about going to heaven's court and presenting your case to heaven's court and how there's protocols to do that in prayer. And it's good teachings. A lot of good stuff in there. And, uh, and, and that's what it was talking about. Talking about getting into the court of heaven. Okay? In Hebrew, this is really important. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this into the chat so you can see this. And you can understand what I'm doing here, what I'm saying here. Okay? In Hebrew, I'm going to put this right here in the chat. Here we go. Okay? Here's what it says. Elohim has taken his place in his divine counsel. He pronounces a judgment on the Elohim. Elohim in the first one, see the word Elohim is the word Elohim. And you only know if it's singular or plural in its context. So, in the first usage here, Elohim, God, it means God. God has taken his place in his divine counsel. So it's his place, his counsel, not their place, their counsel. So it's one. It's talking about Yahweh, the Lord, Jehovah, okay? He pronounces a judgment on the Elohim. Who are <coughs> the Elohim? They're the ones who are the divine counsel. They are the gods, okay? And now he's judging them. That's what Psalm 82 is all about. It's about the judgment of the fallen ones, okay? And he pronounces a judgment on them. It's the same word, Elohim. There's, it, it's, it's singular or plural based on its context, all right? And what it means is, it means the divine one takes his place among the divine ones. That's why he's the only one among them. There is no God like our God. There are gods, but they're not like our God. There is no God but Jehovah. In other words, he's the only one. The rest of them are not like him in every way. He is our God. He is the Lord. They are immortals. They are the sons of God. The Bible calls them the sons of God because they're immortal. They have been made in his image. When Adam was made in the image of God, he was a son of God. The Bible says that Adam, the son of God, and it means Adam was immortal. And when he sinned, God had mercy on him and Eve and put them out of the Garden of Eden so they would not eat of the fruit of the tree of life, and live forever in a sinful state. <clears throat> he had mercy on them and put them out of the garden so they couldn't eat of the tree of life and live forever. Look it up, Genesis chapter 3. So who are these gods? Let's look at some more verses, okay? I've got to give you Psalm 97, verse 9. I'm going to put it down here so you guys, again, this way you can follow along. 
All right, Psalm 97, verse 9. For thou, O Lord, now when you see the word Lord in the Bible with all capitals, that means Jehovah or Yahweh. That means the Lord, the one, okay? The Elohim, not En Elohim, the Elohim. Thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all the gods. Okay? So he's talking about <coughs> other gods. And he says, the Lord Jehovah, he is high above all these other gods. So we have to understand, when the Bible is talking about God being the only God, it means he's the only, in, that, in fact, it says in one place, he is the only high God. He's the highest one. Here's another verse, okay? Psalm 138, verse 1. Psalm 138, verse 1. And here's what it says. I will praise you with my whole heart. In front of the gods, I will sing praise unto thee. Before the gods, in front of the gods, I will sing praise unto thee. Okay? Here's another one. I'm going to read it. Uh, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. We need to understand. Let me put it this way. When it says, before the gods, exalted before the gods, he's saying, you are exalted among the Elohim. You are exalted among all the angels, all the sons of God. And what we need to understand is that the word Elohim is not a, an adjective describing a function like angel. Okay? It speaks of something different. It's actually speaking about a race of heavenly beings. The Elohim are a race. Humans are a race. We're a race of beings. Elohim are a race of beings. The Elohim were made in God's image, after God's likeness, immortal, many other attributes and qualities. Adam was made in God's image, after God's likeness, immortal. But he sinned, and because he's of the earth, when he sinned, he would go into the earth. And if you want to take a look and see in Psalm 82, when I was talking about that judgment on the angels, you'll find out that what God says at the, at the end of that uh, psalm is he says, although you are gods, you shall die like men. So what he's saying is, he's saying to these fallen angels, these fallen Elohim, these fallen ones, the, these fallen watchers, one day you will die like men die. You will not be immortal. You will die like men. And so God is talking about a race of heavenly beings. We call them angels. We would really be better by calling them Elohim. And then when we see one here on earth, that Elohim is an angel. Okay? That's his mess, that's his function. He's a messenger. But they are Elohims. Angel is a job description. Elohim is an identification. It's a race of Elohim, a race of beings that the Bible calls the Elohim. God takes his place in his divine court, in his heavenly council, among the Elohim, he judges among the gods, okay? So, again, if you want to find out more about this, there's a, a tremendous book by an author. His name is Michael Heiser, H-E-I-S-E-R. In fact, I'll type that into the chat for you guys, okay? It's Dr. Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, Michael Heiser, H-E-I-S-E-R. And the book is... The Unseen R-E-A Realm, R-E-A-L-M. If you want to get a book, uh, also you can also get this one here by him. It's called Supernatural, okay? Supernatural or Supernatural Realm. And that's, that's like a little less technical, all right? But these books will help you out, okay? And uh, he pronounces judgment on these Elohim, and he says that you were supposed to be watching mankind, but now you have interfered 
with mankind and I'm judging you because of how you have interfered. You've corrupted mankind. Remember how I started this discussion a couple of weeks ago? If you would ask a Christian, why is mankind so corrupt? They would say, because Adam sinned in the garden. But the Bible teaches us that Adam's sin in the garden was grievous. Yes, it was a, it was a terrible sin, but it was the fallen angels coming to earth that fully corrupted mankind. They're the ones that brought in all the forbidden knowledge and all the forbidden practices and all these things, and they fully corrupted mankind so that his thoughts were always evil. And so God said, I'm gonna get rid of them all. And not only were they corrupted in their minds, they were corrupted in their bodies. They, by the time that Noah and his sons and their wives were left with Noah's wife, they were the only ones left who were pure. The Bible says that Noah was perfect or pure in his generations. In other words, we could trace his generation, his, his father to father to father, all the way back to Adam. But all the others, their genealogy was corrupted because of the fallen angels and the Nephilim. And so the human race was fully corrupted because of that. Now, I was talking with Pastor Rick the other day. He said, just think for a second, how old is America? Well, it's about 250 years old, okay? So in 250 years, we've gone from several thousand, maybe 50,000, I'm not sure how many. I don't know if they did a census back in 1750 or something, 1776, but whatever. But maybe there's uh, 50,000 or even 100,000 people. Let's say 200,000 people, maybe 500,000 people. But in, in 250 years, we've gone from whatever we had Let's say it was a million. We've gone from a million people 250 years ago to 350 million people today in 250 years. Cut that down a little bit. Well, I, I, my point is this. When the fallen angels were on earth, they weren't here for 250 years. They were here for 1,200 years. From the days of Jared to the days of Noah are 1,200 years. And the fallen angels and the Nephilim were on the earth for 1,200 years. How many beings, how many hybrids were born? How many people were corrupted and born corrupt and then corrupted others? How many? Millions. Millions could have been here. Half a million, 500 million, uh, 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 however many. And that's why the earth was so corrupt, because it was totally, totally, totally immersed in this horror that they had. The watchers were supposed to watch over man, but they didn't watch over man. They corrupted mankind. They did a horrible thing in corrupting man. Uh, let's go to Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. Okay? Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. We're going to start there. And here's the background for the story. Most of you might know it. Nebuchadnezzar was the great king. He was the king uh, when Daniel uh, talked to him. He said, he said, he said, God has, has said, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the greatest king. You, you, you are the head of gold in this vision that you had. You are the head of gold. You, you are the greatest one. And he said, but, but what happened is Nebuchadnezzar got so full of himself and he made it that he made a giant image of himself. And he told everybody, you have to worship me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the fiery furnace. God delivers them. Uh, you know, see, if you know God, when the tribulation comes, guess what? God can deliver you too. Okay. You know, when you get thrown in the lion's den during the tribulation, guess what? You know, God can shut the lion's mouth, but you got to know him. You got to walk with him. You got to have a relationship with him. You can't just be a go to church on Sunday person or maybe watch the Bible, you know, once in a while or, you know, do some good deeds. No, you, that's not it. It takes a deep, true, personal relationship with the Lord, a person who's walking with God, walking in the power of God, walking with the armor of God, understanding the times we're living in and knowing there's no time to waste. We have to let people know about Jesus. We have to let them know that the world is getting worse and worse, and they need Jesus as their Savior. We need to save people. Nimrod was a hunter of men. We need to be hunters of men in the opposite way. We need to seek out and save those that are lost, like Jesus said. He was the good shepherd. He sought out and saved those that were lost. And we need to do the same thing. So now, uh, in, in Daniel's time, in Nebuchadnezzar's time, Nebuchadnezzar has become so proud Something happens. He is, it's, just, it's determined in heaven that he is going to become like a beast, like an animal. And for seven years, he's going to eat grass, straw, hay. He's going to live out in the open. 
His nails are going to grow like claws. His hair is going to grow for seven years without a haircut. He's going to be like a wild animal. He's going to have no mind, no human mind. God gave him up and gave him over. And he became a beast. And here's why. Daniel 4, 17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones. You see, there are good watchers and there are evil watchers. The evil watchers corrupted mankind, but the good watchers are judging the way they're supposed to be. They're watching over mankind. They're doing the right things. They're taking care of us. They're, they're, they're watching out for our good, for our needs. They are the angels that surround us and encompass us. They're the ones that protect us. They're the ones that we say, Lord, let your angels surround us. Lord, let your angels protect me when I'm on the highway. Lord, let your angels surround my children when they go to school and protect them and keep them from evil. They're the good ones. And this decree is by the watchers, the holy ones, okay? For the reason that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men. And he gives it to whomever he wills, and he sets it up over the basest of men. So he said, what they're saying is, the watchers are saying, it's God's will that he ultimately rule over all the earth, and he does it through us. We make decisions. Why? Because we think like him. Because we're made in his image. Because we haven't sinned and rebelled against him. We think like him. We act like him. And he trusts us to, to have his will done in the earth. Isn't that what we're supposed to be like? You know that word, holy ones? Hagion in Greek. It means saints. To the saints, Paul writes. To the holy ones. We're supposed to be like the watchers. We're supposed to be watching over. We're supposed to be our brother's keepers. We're supposed to be the ones that love others and care for others and watch out for them. And we're supposed to be the ones that make decisions that are righteous and holy and godlike. And he says, these, these, Daniel says, this is the decree of the watchers by the demand of the holy ones. You will become a beast. These are the good ones. And so in this, in this time, when this happened... Nebuchadnezzar becomes a beast. For seven years he's like that. And at the end of seven years, all of a sudden, and I mean all of a sudden, he gets his mind back. Are any of you praying for someone who has lost their mind? Well, pray. Because in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, they can get their mind back. Because God can give it back to them. So if you've got a loved one, that has fallen astray, if you've got someone you love and care for, it's close to you, and they're so far away from God, it's unbelievable, you pray, and you hold on, and you trust in the Lord, and you put on the whole armor of God, and you gird up the loins of your mind, and you think good thoughts, and you start to walk in faith, and you say, I'm praying for this one, and as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. And you put the promises of God in that situation. And you begin to say things like that. You begin to get to know the Word of God and get the Word of God in your mouth and speak the Word of God. And when you do this out of love and compassion, not because you're a big shot, not because I have the power of God, I'm a mighty uh, child of God, I'm a son of God. When you do that and you do it in humility, believe me, you're going to see a change in the people that you want changing. You're gonna see it happen. All of a sudden, God will give them their right mind again. If they've been given up and given over, God can take them back and bring them back, just like he did the prodigal son. You know, the thing about the prodigal son is that it says that when he decided to come back, while he was still far off, his father saw him coming and ran to meet him. You see, the father had faith that he would come home. When you've given up on somebody, you've lost your faith, they probably won't come home. And if they do come home, it won't be because of you. It'll just be the mercy of God. But when you have faith, and you're looking down the road, and you're looking, expecting your loved one to come back to Jesus, when you're expecting that son or daughter, that husband, that wife, that uncle, that aunt, that mother, that father, that sister, that brother, that friend, whoever it is, when you're looking down the road expecting that they're going to come back 
because you've been praying for them, because you're trusting God, and you're telling the Lord, Lord, I, I love them so much, but you love them more. You died for them, Jesus. Jesus, this is one of your lost sheep. Jesus, you said, I go out and seek and save those that are lost. Then let the Lord use you to pray and intercede that they may come back and get their right mind. Remember the demoniac in the Gadarene district? He lived in the caves and he had no his, he'd lost his mind. He was given over. He was possessed by hundred demons. And after he met Jesus, instead of being naked and running around crazy, scaring people and doing horrible things, he sat clothed in his right mind with Jesus. That's why I want my loved ones. I want them clothed in their right minds. I want them walking with Jesus again. I want them serving the Lord. So as, as bad as the days of Noah were, as bad as things are today, no matter what's going on, we have faith, hope, and love. Faith to walk with God and to trust God for his promises for us and our loved ones. Hope that never lets us down. A confident expectation that the Lord will do what he said he'll do. And love that covers a multitude of sin. No matter what's going on, no matter what's happened, God is going to take care of them. God's going to be with them. Amen. We need to believe those things. We need to trust in God. We need to believe in the Lord. Listen, remember that divine counsel I spoke about a few moments ago? It's not just bad guys. There's good guys too. They're the good watchers. They're the ones that are watching out for us. They're the holy ones. They're the ones that are taking care of things. They're protecting us, watching over our children. They're the ones that we need to trust in the Lord, that God is taking care of things. The Lord is doing it. God is in control of these situations. They try to build a gate to the gods. We don't have to try. We can come before the throne of grace in a time of need. We can trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge Him and He will direct our steps. Amen? Amen. Thank you for being with me tonight. Uh, share what we're going through. Share what we've done. Let people know what's happening. And uh, God be with you in the name of Jesus as we continue to go through what he's doing in the last days. Amen? In the last days, not only will it be terrible times, but in the last days, there'll be awesome times because the Bible tells us that in the last days, they that know their God shall do exploits. Get ready for some exploits. Trust in the Lord, in Jesus' name. I bless you right now in Jesus' name. May the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you, keep you, lead you, and guide you into all truth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Looking forward to seeing you again.